going to the quarantine still starting outside. Welcome to this third part of my conversation with Pastor Carlethea Benson. In today's concluding part of our conversation, Pastor Benson shares a little bit about why Christians should care about striving for racial justice and equality and a few next steps that Christians can take to move us in that direction. So thank you so much for joining in for this three-part conversation with Pastor Benson. Well, I know you mentioned some of the disparities that we don't necessarily explicitly name as race, uh, but that that exist, whether we name it or not. And, and I, I think of, um, I think it's at last year's annual conference that for the South Carolina United Methodist Church, right. and uh, the cabinet put some some bar graphs up on the the screen, showing you know here's how much. Uh, white clergy make, uh-huh. here's how much black clergy make, here's how much male clergy make, Right. here's how much female clergy make. Uh, and, I mean, it's just right there in black and white um, that, that we do not all get paid <laughs> the same for the same kind of work on the basis of our, our color of our skin and gender. So it's in the, the church as well. Exactly, it is. And guess what? They didn't show the part for local pastors. They right. only show the ones who were elders, or you know, like that deacon and, and right. whatever. They didn't. They didn't go into that area because right. we get paid a whole lot less, and we work. And I can't say all of us because none of us are all. I don't care right. what it, in right. any situation. But as for myself, I was in Florence almost every day, sometimes twice a day at the hospital. And if somebody called at night, I had folks tell me, say, why didn't you wait till the next day? Well, I'm not guaranteed that person going to be alive the next day. So I would get up and go at one o'clock in the morning and be there. Sometimes I've stayed all night with a patient, mm-hmm. with one of the members, because they were, they were sick and there was no family member to be there. And I stayed as their pastor. I believe that as a shepherd, there are things that we're called to do mm-hmm. and to be. Well, and I, I've had... A lot of friends who've articulated this, and I, I, I would echo it myself, is that our, our denomination, if it weren't for local pastors, <laughs> uh, we, our churches would be in a whole heap of trouble. Um, yeah. we need yeah. and, and clergy would be well, overloaded, because at one time right. they used to have up to five churches each, mm-hmm. because they didn't have the local pastor. Right. And once that happened, then um, the ones that are the larger churches are usually given to the uh, clergy who are ordained elders are provisionary elders and then the smaller churches are given to the local pastor. And so given uh, disparities in the church and, and especially thinking of, along racial lines, um, to me this should be obvious but I'd, I'd be interested in, in, in your particular response. Why is this something that white Christians in particular should care about uh, as far as uh, addressing racism, addressing uh, disparities in how people are treated across racial lines? Why, why should particularly white Christians um, be invested in that when they know that they're not going to deal with any of the consequences of, of, of that system? They should invest in it because they call themselves Christians. And the word Christian means Christ-like. And if you're truly Christ-like, then you're going to care about the least of these. You're going to want to make sure that if they have a need, it's met. He says, you do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Christ taught, you feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and give water a you to those who are thirsty. So if you find that your brother or sister in a different hue is not getting what they need, then if you have the power to bring about the change and that person, that group doesn't, not on their own, then you need to join with them and, and, and show that Christ is alive and well and he's moving through us as Christians. Christ didn't sit back when it was 
uncomfortable mm. when he went into the temple and they were in there and they the money changes and everything. He didn't say, oh, well, they're in my father's house doing this wrong. He overthrew the tables and he showed his disgust at what they were doing in that place. We sometimes have to rise up and show the disgust that we have at how folks are being treated differently only because of the color of their skin, the disparities, the racism, the, and, and prejudices. We all have prejudices and biases, but racism is one of those things segregated by wealth and by power. We don't have the wealth and the power. So that's the reason it said that whites can be racist. Some people say, well, you're racist. No, I can't be. I don't have any money. <laughs> what little bit I have, I struggle with each month. I don't have, I have a little power because I believe God gives me power. So I use my voice in every place that I can. It's just like we're getting ready to vote. You know, I'm going to be out there trying to get everybody I can to the polls to vote. I don't care. I'm not asking them who they're voting for. All I want to do is to make sure that they vote. And the thing about that is, we all have that, but we know people that don't go vote because they don't have somebody to give them a ride. If I, God gives me the breath to be here, that won't be the case for me. I plan to take that day and make sure that any and everybody that needs a way will have a way to get there to vote. And not only that, you don't have to take them. Your church can go and get the envelopes from the voter registration office for the number of persons that you need it for. They can be filled out by those people. And then the person that picked it up will sign on the back of it, validating it. And you turn all those back in yourself. So it's not like we have to always go. Sometimes somebody can go, get, bring it in, make sure people vote, take it back. But that's being Christ-like. Christ was one who was with the marginalized. Those, you know, the people that had, they didn't need it. But the people that were in need, he met the folks where they were. And what he did for them is what changed them. When he fed the ones that were hungry, the 5,000 plus, the reason that they listened was because they had food in their stomach. When a child is hungry, it's hard for a child to, to learn because they're hungry and the stomach is pulling and tugging at them and it's hard for their minds to concentrate. Mm. But it's easy for us to put together food bags and have them on the weekends and say, if we know anybody in the community that needs anything, come by and get it. You know, it's those kind of things, little things. Yeah. I remember a, a a friend one time saying it's hard to praise God on an empty stomach. That's right. It is. That, it is. that those physical needs are, are important. Exactly. And that's the reason he lifted them up. And so I know, you know, some of the things that, that that's wonderful reasons why, why people should be invested in, in work uh, for racial justice and, and for equity and, and, um, and for addressing those disparities. For anybody who is listening to this conversation and is thinking, you know, what's one thing I can do that would be helpful to address some of these disparities, to address racism? Um, how would you answer that from your perspective? What's one thing somebody can do? Sit down and talk with somebody that doesn't look like you. Have an honest, open conversation where you go in not to judge, but to listen, to hear what the person's been through, to hear why the person feels like they do. And then by the time, I, I guarantee you, by the time it's over, you will have a different perspective on the life of those that are not like you. I think of uh, how Jesus, he, changed, he transformed people through relationship. That's right. That it is. And you know, what does it say for us? It's, we teach. It's about a relationship with Jesus 
that we are enabled to we are enabled to be able to see God, right? right. To be in the kingdom. Right. So if, if the relationship part is important here through Christ, would you not think the relationship part would be important between us as people call ourselves Christians and others out there who need to know who he is? It's it's amazing. Um, yeah. you know, uh, my chair of PPRC when I was in Lake City. She used to laugh, and the only reason I got the award, I got at annual conference, uh, the Evangelism Award, was because they wrote and they said, this woman, everywhere she goes, I don't care what store she's in, grocery store, it was a Roses, Walmart, wherever, she always found somebody to talk to about Jesus. I did, mm -hmm. and I still do it here. Right. I go out. I pray each morning that the Lord will allow me to have an encounter with somebody that I can tell them about him and about his son. And every time I pray it, I find somebody that I get a chance to talk to. And boy, do we have a hallelujah good time. <laughs> well, I, I think uh, that's a good uh, stopping point for this part of the conversation, uh, the, the transformation in, in those encounters uh, with other people, those relationships that we can build. Exactly. And I certainly have, have experienced transformation through, uh, through the relationship that we have begun building with one another. And I thank you for that. Exactly. Uh, I pray you. that you and, and all of us will continue to build those relationships across racial lines and, and all the other lines that we construct um, so that we might come to see, see Christ in everyone. Amen and build justice and yeah. God's kingdom. Amen. Well, I thank you again. I thank everybody for, for watching this conversation. If you do have questions, uh, feel free to leave those in the comments and I would be glad to respond to those or, or have Pastor Benson try to respond to some of those as well. Um, and again, Jonathan, I invite yes. your church family at any time Let's sit and talk. I invite them. You invite me, I will come. Let's have a dialogue. Let's bring some other folks in. Let's hear the story. And then I think we can begin to see. And we want to hear their stories as well. So, uh, you know, I, open, I offer that as a part of our time together that we can sit down and have a talk. And I appreciate that, that offer and invitation and look forward to, to doing that at some point in the future. Amen. Thank you very much. Well, thanks. And uh, we'll continue our conversation uh, with me and you down the road, okay? All right. Sounds great. All you right. be blessed thank and you. thank you so much for inviting me. All right. You be blessed too, Pastor Benson. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.